Um, and the talk I gave yesterday, that's the title that you see here. Uh, and in that talk, I focused on the vision of algorithmic regulation that's taken shape in the design and marketing of mainstream tracking technology. Uh, and that, that technology addresses the consumer as a subject who must make choices in this toxic, tempting, confounding consumer landscape.
thoughts. Here we go. Huh? It should be great. That's where it was before. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so in this counterintuitive way, what gamblers, and it's often weird to me to even talk of them as gamblers, but you know, for lack of a better term, what they're seeking through engagements with gambling machines is a zone of reliability, safety, affective calm that removes them from a, a range of different volatilities that they experience in their social, financial, and personal lives. And even though this activity deals in chance, the process of it holds uh, world worldly contingencies, you could say, in a kind of abeyance by immediately resolving bets with the quick press of a button and sort of ad admitting gamblers to this otherwise elusive zone of certainty. So it, it's almost as if the digitally mediated tempo of play uh, functions as a kind of predictability that structures and regulates it. And it, there's a transformation of risk into rhythm. So even though choices are multiplied, they're digitally reformatted as a kind of self-dissolving flow that unfolds in the absence of choosing as such. It's hard to say that someone is a choosing subject when they are choosing 1,200 times um, in an hour. Um, and here's a quote from uh, a woman named Sharon. I was addicted to making decisions in an unmessy way, to engaging in something where I knew what the outcome would be. Um, and she went on to give me this um, quote. Uh, most people define gambling as chance where you don't know the outcome, but I do know I'm going to win or lose. I don't care if it takes coins or pays coins. The contract is when I put a new coin in, get five new cards and press the buttons, I am allowed to continue. That's really the aim. So it isn't really a gamble at all. It's one of the few places I'm certain about anything. Um, and she goes on to say that if she had ever believed it was really about chance, uh, then she would have been scared to death. Uh, if you can't rely on the machine, you may as well be in the human world where you have no predictability either. So uh, in the book, I consider a, a whole range of elements of design from architectural and ergonomic features to audio visuals, um, haptic buttons, as well as, and importantly, or most importantly, uh, the different mathematical structures of game algorithms that live inside and act inside the machine and how all of those facilitate uh, this exit into the zone. And I just wanted to give one example before uh, moving on um, to my more current work. And that would be the design of uh, what are called multi-line video slot machines that have become wildly popular. And even though they're often penny machines, they, uh, they are 90% of the profits of the industry today. And I'll just briefly explain how they work uh, so you can understand how game algorithms are at stake here. So instead of restricting players to bet on the outcome of one row of symbols across three reels, like you see here, the newer devices, um, and this is a very simplistic 2005 device, I think. Many, there's many more symbols on other machines, but these newer devices allow you to bet on multiple lines, and you can see the number of lines. There's 50 on this particular machine, and the lines are not always exactly lines. Uh, they don't just go straight across. They go diagonally. They zigzag, sometimes even horizontally, or sometimes even scatter. So you're trying to pack more and more things to bet on in one hand. It's almost like diversifying your portfolio or something. Um, so back when uh, a player was doing this, they would either double or triple their money if they won, win nothing, and lose the bet totally. So that's actually quite volatile. Even if we're talking about a nickel or a quarter, um, that is quite a volatile proposition where you double or triple or you lose. Volatility goes away um, in this iteration of gambling machine in the sense that they're going to pay something back most of the time because you're betting on so many lines. So the catch is, uh, and every time you win on a line, ding, 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 same reinforcement. So you're liable to experience that sameness of feedback on um, nearly every hand. Um, and here's the catch. Even though you're constantly quote unquote winning um, back a tiny portion of your bet, you're always losing because you're putting 40 in, you're winning three back, 30 in, um, you know, 12 back. So even as you're steadily losing, what you feel while you're playing is this steady reinforcement of music and graphics. And so what matters there 
um, is not actually the winning. Gamblers aren't out to win. It's the smoothness of the experience. It's the fact that you can kind of go all the way down to zero and not feel that you're moving anywhere. Uh, it's, it sort of lulls you into this trance-like rhythmic state. Uh, so you're out of time, you're out of uncertainty, and you, you are not in the self. You're, you're, you're removed from the self. So the second case that I want to consider um, is a sort of linchpin between my first and second book uh, because it concerns a highly digitally mediated uh, form of gambling that also involves intensive self-tracking and other tracking. So it involves players in a very different relationship to time and to uncertainty and to the self. So here you see the screen of an online poker player as he practices um, what's called multi-tabling, which on the face of it has a lot in common with multi-line video uh, screens that we just saw. Um, even this image, it looks like many little things, but if, but if we drill down into the specifics here, we can see the differences. Um, and also, there's ways that it shares with and departs from live poker. So in online poker, you are playing against other people, not like video poker or slot machine. But uh, unlike something like live poker, you're, you're, uh, you're not attending to a single event stream in time where you have to, um, at a table, playing with other people, you need to spend most of your time waiting, right? Waiting for other people, folding, you don't have the right cards. Here, you are virtually seated at multiple tables and you are playing against other people but you're not waiting for them you are quickly navigating your mouse across the screen and you're just settling for moments at a time on windows that flash a little bit at you calling for your attention where your input is needed to advance play and if you wait too long you miss the turn there um, and I wanted to just give you uh, a sense of what this looks like and there, there's some um, oddly heroic music played behind it which also I'll leave in there a little bit of it and then I'll turn it off because it's quite annoying music um, but it, it th th this guy really is a hero there's a sort of heroism in this tedious little clicking even though you know it looks a lot like a slot machine player so see if I can click this. So he's starting out small. said the music got annoying so I'll um, turn it down now um, so if, if I hadn't said that th that self-tracking was involved here you might have understood this to be a form of essentially a form of slot machine gambling because there's a similar flow and absorption and the multi tabling aspect um, does dilute a sense of risk the way that multi-line slots dilute a sense of volatility and risk because by multiplying the number of tables you're playing at you are making making less significant each bet. There's not so much at stake, literally. Um, and yet the gambler seated here is not attempting to zone away from life and its uncertainties, um, nor is his primary talos to win in any one session. Um, instead, what, what I argue is that it's to hone his skill at acting decisively, uh, both within the game and outside of the game. So it's really a self-fashioning exercise, and that's how gamblers in interviews, online poker players, talked about it with me. Uh, online poker is a field for digitally mediated ethical formation, you could say. Um, and you may have noticed after the beginning that his head is turning quickly to the left and to the right to look at the other screens, and that's very significant because there's an intensive amount of data analysis software that is running. And what it's doing is it's helping to configure the field of uncertainty in such a way that it enables him to act in response to it so that he can stay in the game, not get out of the game, go into the zone. Um, what he's doing there, uh, and this is a title of an article I, I've written on this um, last year, uh, he's abiding chance, not exiting from it. 
So the most important tool, um, I'll just go through a few of these because there are so many. Uh, the, the most important tool at a player's disposal during a game session is the HUD or the heads up display. And this is um, something that exists in other forms of game as well. And what the HUD is doing in poker is continuously querying the database of hand histories that the game is constantly logging. And it's providing a player with up-to-date information in real time on, on opponent's behavior patterns and that is what is presented here so um, in, these are each players and then hovering over them um, are, are these kind of panels of letters and numbers um, and essentially the, the letters are acronyms for behavioral tendencies relevant to poker uh, and the numbers are statistical scores that identify uh, wh where a player falls in a range for those tendencies and it can shift you know, as you're playing even. So taken together, if you give a quick glance to this and you're an experienced online poker player, um, you get enough information on opponents' playing styles to act strategically against them. And some people choose, like this open window is where you wanna take time, you know, time is really valuable, but you wanna take time to kind of learn more or drill down. So if you hover over something, you can um, see more statistics about that person. Uh, so the numeric values, the values that are on display here, really are a form of virtual tell. Uh, instead of you know looking through your sunglasses across the table at someone and sussing them out, uh, uh, as in live poker, what you're doing is you're glancing at the HUD, as the as the guy was doing in the video. You're glancing at these numbers, uh, and you're knowing with that glance, is this an inexperienced newcomer, a seasoned professional? Uh, where does this person fall on the aggression factor spectrum? Um, things like this. So a player named Justin, um, and I should say that from here on out, I'm going to draw on his words and experiences a lot. He's a high stakes, very successful online poker player. Uh, he says, the numbers in the display tell you this player has certain tendencies, and you can take that information into account right before you make a decision about a hand. You trust the information more than your own memory. You feel more comfortable taking action and doing it faster. So this is not a slot machine uh, gambler who wants to be out of the world of choice. This guy really wants to keep choosing, but needs help doing it. Uh, the, but I wouldn't call him a sovereign subject, and that mistake I think gets made a lot too, uh, too often when looking at financial actors like this. Uh, the numbers make the decision-making process easier, less agonizing. It becomes much more of a binary yes-no process. So HUD numbers may help a players feel more confident in their decision-making process, but I, I want to emphasize that they're not telling you what to do. They're not pinning down opponent's behavior or predicting what they're going to do next. Uh, they're not eliminating uncertainty. They're, they're sort of like a stock, mark, uh, stock market index. It's a kind of informational scrim um, that's more like in, in speculation rather than a prediction. And so what you do is you consult that screen, and this will be important when we move on to tracking, uh, when it, it's offered to you as a kind of digital compass that you as a subject can consult to then modulate your own actions rather than to robotically follow its dictates. Um, as, as Justin told us, you can take the information into account. As, uh, you know, this is a compass to navigate the field of uncertainty. So this matrix that the HUD has of, of statistical scores and things I didn't even explore with you, like how you color code for yourself, this is all customized, um, the, the different numbers, and then you can have certain things flash at you when they cross certain thresholds. There's a lot at play here that I'm not gonna talk about, um, but all of that is helping you more quickly detect what's, what might be happening in a moment, um, and that is very important to helping you remain calm uh, and not go into a state of tilt, uh, which comes from pinball, but it's a, a, a very sort of shaken, disequilibrated state that you absolutely don't want to be in. So uh, 
I want to say, you know, you may be wondering, where's the self-tracking? So the HUD is an informational guide, it turns out, not simply for opponents' tendencies, but your own tendencies. Because in addition to statistically sussing out other players, it shows you how you appear to them. So there's a theory of mind kind of thing going on here. You're, you're absolutely um, in, in the intersubjective world. You are not in, in the zone. Um, Justin says, I try to gauge what information they might have on me. I look at their behavior toward me and also the speed of their play against me. Based on that, I can guess how aware they are of how I typically behave and I can adjust my behavior accordingly. So how does he adjust it? He tries to scramble the data to keep people guessing about his play styles. Uh, and he is striving to project a statistical profile that is totally flat, balanced, untilted. It has no edges. It has has um, no signals or tells that, that could be exploited by discerning opponents um, and their algorithms. Um, for instance, he, he always takes the exact, so how would you do that? Right? How, so you would take the exact same number of seconds, because of course you have a timer while you're playing, um, to make a decision. Even if you know immediately what you're going to do, or if you're struggling, you let the clock, the timer run down to one second, and then you take an action. Um, and he's also been using a metronome while he plays. This was something he had just begun to do when he talked to me. He said, I'm experimenting with that. Um, and the idea was that he wanted to externally regulate um, his breathing and his decision making um, as he was playing. He can also turn um, after play to his database of hand histories and then more intensively and retrospectively, so it's a different kind of stance on one's data because you're not in the moment decision making, um, you can retrospectively examine what went down and what patterns might be revealed there, how you might want to um, change your play style and you ask yourself questions. Um, my win rate is dropping the more tables I play simultaneously. Um, am I overvaluing you know, this kind of play? Am I playing too many hands from middle position? So it's this self-querying, right? This taking inventory. It's a, it's a, um, it's a, it's a practice, you could say, um, of self-fashioning. Uh, in the moment, the right decision is not clear, but in the aggregate, you can see how it makes sense to act. Certain things come up over and over and start to make sense. Now, you never do this after every session. You need to let the data accumulate, and you hear this a lot in self-tracking communities as well, that there's no point, you know, as you do in financial trading communities, there's no point in seeing at the end of a session whether you won or lost. Um, you need to dip in over when you have a good amount of time series data. Um, so, <laughs> the idea behind that is that you have to have a fairly large number of hands, or in life, a fairly large number of steps, or hours, or nights of sleep, um, in order not to be, as Justin told me, fooled by randomness. Um, so what you're doing is, um, you are looking at the scores that the algorithms give you after a certain amount of time, and if your score about how you played, um, how you're improving, if that score is good, then you should feel good, but you should not look at how much you won or lost, because you could have lost a lot of money but played excellently. And so you're trying to, to separate those two things in this ultra-rational way. Uh, so you could say that the uh, the ontology at stake here is not a self whose values determined in the moments of winning and losing, a sort of phenomenological subject in the moment of the event at the poker table, for example. Um, this is a self that accretes, You're, the value of this self accretes through many tiny actions over time. And to optimize that value potential, you have to respect the law of large numbers at every decision point. So the law of large numbers, um, if, if there is a god in all of this, it is the law of large numbers. Uh, missed one there, okay. And just to say that, because this does relate a lot to the tracking, um, contemporary tr self-tracking, Justin spoke about himself as a dynamic database uh, and whose real value is always emergent and impossible to assess without sufficient temporal uh, resolution. Okay. Uh, when you play online at multiple tables, you can see very visibly the swings. You learn that in the short term, there will be lots of variance, even if you're making all the right decisions. And for a longer talk, I would then go to the parts of our interview where he 
takes this out into his romantic and job life um, and, and argues that playing poker this way trains him and gives him a subjective readiness for the variance of life. Um, it helps him to, again, to abide chance. So these tools we've looked at so far, um, the self-tracking you can do, these dynamic numerical displays, visualizations, uh, the tracking your opponents, all of that together is designed to help you act in worldly time, linear time, but from the vantage point of this infinite temporal field where probabilistic values can be trusted to, to bear out. So you trust in that, that is your leap of faith. Uh, and the tools, uh, these kind of tools are arming, as I said, they're arming players against this dreaded state of tilt, which is sort of the state of, of being human and falling into passion where you can't see clearly. Um, it's, it's again, this, this sort of shaken state that you can enter during the course of a game. Um, and some even use software like Tilt Breaker. And this software takes advantage of your uh, impulsive state because the idea that it is it lives there on the screen and if you're in a really impulsive mode you're not going to you know go and shut yourself out in any methodical careful way but you might just throw your finger on the button and lock yourself out impulsively you know from that state of passion so there, there's um, other software have things called a rage quit button for instances of super tilt um, algorithms that if they see you playing at a certain speed or a certain length will say would you like to take a break you know just as the smart water bottle would suggest it's time to have a sip of water etc time to stand up and stretch so um I wanted to uh, extend this discussion of sort of algorithmic regulation to a set of practices that don't on the face of it look algorithmic, um, or maybe they do, but not um, digitally so. So this um, is an artifact that this guy Justin gave me. Um, this is his cool down checklist. And he, he's always revising this, but he's assessing his performance uh, with this checklist. Uh, he records the day he played, you know, down his like notes field at the bottom, how much time, number of hands, and then he's doing all of this rating of himself, um, mega tilted, maximal game time spent focused. Um, so he's always uh, rating, rating his own subjective impression of himself. Again, he's not correlating it with wins or losses right away. Uh, and directly before a next session, he consults uh, his warm-up checklist. Um, so on here, I don't know if you can read it from where you're sitting, but there are simple items that many of us have heard out there in sort of popular knowledge about how to remain focused. You make sure your desk is clutter-free and um, you have a glass of water, you've eaten enough food. Uh, but then there's larger goals as well, like how to raise your motivation. If you're feeling unmotivated, um, you do push-ups or take a while to study some poker. Um, and there's categories like mental focus points. And then the last item, uh, reasons to take time before clicking slash making a decision. That's really the most important thing on here. Um, somewhere uh, under mental focus points actually, take time for decisions, count out loud, and then there are all the reasons to take time before clicking and making a decision. And the first of those is because I click less from emotion when I do that. Because again, he's striving to act from a statistical plane, not, um, not the event itself. Um, so he, you know, he wants to locate himself in a field of uncertainty, but he can never fully locate himself there. It's that leap of faith he has to do. And so to get there, he has to kind of modulate himself through breath and counting and quantification. You're making so many decisions, a lot of them will just happen intuitively. In most cases, that's fine, but when I enter that gray area where it's not certain what I should do, I wanna make sure I don't rely only on my intuitions. What I do is pause every time I'm facing a difficult decision. I try to count down in my head, three, two, one. I breathe in and out and try to override my intuition. Recently, I ordered a metronome to see if it might help with that process and prevent me from making decisions too quickly. My thinking is, if I have a metronome, 
metronome, it will give me some sort of external rhythm. Um, and of course, there's many instances throughout history where metronomes and chants and other things have provided a sort of external rhythm that perhaps is also about abiding chants. Um, he says, I plan to experiment with that. So, uh, just lifting out of this a little bit, uh, there, there's a much admired live poker player named Jennifer Harmer who once said, uh, I wish I was a robot. Uh, and she explained how hard it was to act in any given moment according to these statistical laws that she knew, rationally speaking, she should trust. So online, you have at your disposal a host of tools to help you dial down your passion and in the heat of the game and to become, if you will, more robotic. But at the same time, uh, all of these gamblers who are using these tools worry. Um, they worry that indifference, you know, the, the neutrality, the untiltedness, the statistical indifference they're trying to project, uh, taken to its logical extreme, might squeeze out the possibility for decision making altogether. Um, Here's a quote that speaks to that. If everyone uses these stats and uses them correctly, and that is the trend, um, in the early days only some players use them, now it's pretty requisite that you need to use this tracking software to play, then there will be no room left to have an edge because everyone will have the same information, like we're all bots playing each other. So when that point is reached, he went on, uh, the game will be ruined for everyone. So he really talked about it as a sort of tragedy of, of the common, of the digital commons, I guess. Um, online gamblers' um, anxiety here, which is sort of an anxiety about the, the botification of the game, uh, is most obvious in this harsh shunning of poker bots. So poker bots are algorithms that pose as players, and they multi-table around the clock to collect vast quantities of data on real players um, that others can later purchase uh, to access these, these profiles on opponents that they actually have never had their own experience with. Um, that's considered cheating in no uncertain terms. It's a shameful violation of the rules of the game. But alongside those easy denouncements of bots, uh, there is this kind of creeping concern among players that their own use of poker tracking tools, which are now universally accepted aspect of play, uh, might be turning them for all intents and purposes into robots of a sort. And uh, Justin did um, speak to me about this worry. Um, and I said, so I asked him how not to be a bot, because that seemed to be important to him. Uh, and his response to that question, which really is an ethical question, was to make a small but significant revision to his poker uh, regimen. He said, uh, if you imagine a scale from negative five to plus five, I'd say I want to be a plus one. For a long time, I thought the best state to be in was zero. I operated that way for years. Operating at zero, you're acting like a perfect robot. But the risk in that for me was that I didn't listen to any emotional signals because I was trying to rationalize everything. But now I try to let, a, let in a signal so I can then decide if I should take that signal into account in my decision-making process or not. So again, taking into account is... Um, what, what he believes he should do. Um, and this revision, um, which was prompted, I should say, not by uh, a lack of success in poker, but by the failure of a romantic relationship um, that seemed him, to him to be a perfect match on paper. Um, this was based on his realization that in order to act optimally and humanly in moments of uncertainty, um, he mustn't allow himself to become fully robotic. He has to leave himself open just a tiny bit, right, an increment of plus one to these affective qualitative intuitive signals or to the unknown um, so he he explains then to me um, how this new orientation departs from his former discounting of emotion um, I've come to understand if I use a rational model become more robotic I feel disconnected from the world and not sure of what I want to do so he actually stops having a hold in, in being a subject of decision making. That's why I try to open the interval to plus one. Before I tried to ignore or discount my gut feeling, I thought it was never to be trusted. I didn't know what I could do with it. Now I try to use it as a signal in those gray areas uh, where things are uncertain. So to get himself to plus one, um, what does he do? 
he tweaks his algorithm. Um, so he, he says, one of the things in my warm-up used to not be uh, to not drink coffee, but now I always drink one cup of coffee. So he, he's figured out one cup of coffee equals plus one, or espresso before a session. Uh, he said, it has become a ritual. Um, music is also important. He said, uh, basically what I do is configure my playlist to get me in that emotional state of plus one. So some days I choose mellow music, uh, but maybe I'm already at a three because I'm at a three and I need to bring myself down. Other days I choose more activating music to bring myself up. So as he tells it, this interval of plus one marks um, essentially the, the interval of uncertainty, uncertainty and potential passion that he recognizes he can never do away with, which is what makes him human. Um, and what he shouldn't do away with also uh, in, in sort of the honest pursuit of this quest to live and act in the world as an ethical subject. So he diverges from this wish to be a robot and creates for himself a space where the task is not to statistically assess or programmatically execute, but to intuitively apprehend and exercise choice outside of algorithmic parameters. Um, so he's struggling with this possibility that agency might lie there. Um, However, the, uh, some of you may be thinking this, this revised approach uh, raises a new question because is this new protocol a break with robotically rational paradigm or not? Because this space of possibility he opens is not actually open-ended, it's numerically bounded. It is associated with a whole set of procedures. Uh, so despite his claim to kind of move beyond reason, you could interpret this plus one system as even more rational um, to him. And it wasn't clear, and I don't think it was clear to him. We, we actually talked about this. Um, so he said, yeah, maybe this is actually more robotic and more rational than my former zero-oriented system. Um, and, and in the end, his answer to the question of how not to be a bot um, remain ambivalent, I think. Um, so to end this case, I'll say that it, it was this case, and um, I actually met him at a quantified self meeting in 2012. Um, this pushed me into my project on self-tracking, and I couldn't resist sort of pressing pause and taking a little trajectory off into the world of online poker. Um, and now I see that that was a, a good trajectory because so many of the same questions come up in the ways that uh, wearable technology apps and data analytics are mediating agency and contingency, um, and the ethical question of what kind of selves we should be. So in my last few minutes, I want to move to um, another case of self-tracking, but this is from a write-up of an interview I conducted with a, a longtime self-tracker um, named Eric Boyd, who, who's a mechanical engineer. He runs Toronto's um, Quantified Self Meetup, and I'll tell you a little bit more about Quantified Self um, in a moment. So um, he believes the tools and practices of self-quantification, um, and I'll just read from my write-up here, are less about numbers than self-discovery. The reason you, quote, the reason you begin tracking your data is you have some uncertainty about yourself. You believe the data can illuminate. It's about introspection, reflection, seeing patterns, and arriving at realizations about who you are and how you might change. And yet this intimate journey commences not with a turn inward, but with a turn outward to the streaming data of a device, an extraction, a quantification, a visualization. Self-tracking following Boyd renders, quote, a digital mirror. It lets you look at things you otherwise couldn't see just using your own eyes and to see yourself more honestly. At his company SenseBridge, Boyd de designs a variety of devices intended to produce these digital mirrors of the self. The heart spark pendant, for instance, flashes in time with one's heartbeat, externalizing the body's affective rhythms. Sound spark flashes along with the cadence of one's voice, and a compass anklet vibrates to augment your sense of direction. As experience feeds into data streams, so data streams feed back into experience, becoming a vital aspect of sentience and self-knowledge. Boyd distinguishes data-driven modes of self-discovery from those of talk-based therapy. Quantified self is not a linguistic exploration like psychoanalysis. It's more of a digital exploration. And the stuff you're exploring is made up of many little bits and moments. One arrives at insights not through language unfolding in time, he elaborates, but through tracking these bits and moments over time. He says, uh, you may not gain any knowledge in a week or a month, 
but maybe with a year of data you might see something significant about yourself. You need a view that's longer than whatever moment you're in. So he too, in that sense, we could say is a kind of um, gambler like Justin, or attempting to abide chance. Boyd shifts the plane of existential significance and the possibility of self-knowing from the fleeting temporality of single events to the longitudinal temporality of accretion. Um, and then he gave me, th then he said something I hadn't been expecting. Um, in our physical world, we're actually quite small creatures. Our powers only extend a few meters, but in the temporal dimension, we're extremely effective. The trouble for us is it's difficult for us to see the amount of power we have in time because our sense of time is so limited. We go through life one minute at a time, but we're actually going to live a billion moments or something like that. So digital tracking and time series analysis for him uh, is what allows him to take stock of those billion moments. Uh, he said they, they give us a longer view of our power in time by showing us how our habits, the things we're doing over and over, add up to affect our lives in positive and negative ways. Now I'm going to quote Gary Wolf, who's sitting right here. Um, Without good time calibration, says Gary Wolf, a founder of QS, who's, <laughs> who's here with us, um, it's much harder to see the consequences of your action. So tracking tools become ethical tools, technologies of the self. Uh, and in self-tracking, Boyd finds a pathway from knowledge to self-transformation. Uh, tracking has allowed him to regard himself as a time series self and he finds that liberating, he finds that empowering. So Boyd is a member of Quantified Self, uh, this international collective of individuals that was started by two editors of Wired magazine. Um, and the people who participate are uh, ascribing to this, this quest for self-knowledge through numbers, as the tagline here shows. So it's a kind of, um, you could say, um, to, to evoke Paul Rabinow, it's a kind of data sociality where you participate in online forums and meetings around the world to share your attempts to experiment with diet and meditation, uh, correlate hormone levels with mood or relationship dynamics, or even evaluate semantic content in your email. Um, for clues to unhappiness um, and then use those as guides to make decisions. So it's a phenomenon in which you are uh, employing this range of apps and gadgets and sometimes pen and paper to scrutinize the quanta of your own lived experience. So uh, I see it as embracing numerical metrics and statistical correlation as a route to the good life. This is, I see really, a, a vision of technologically assisted self-care. Um, and what my talk yesterday was about was about what happens to that vision as it moves outward toward mainstream consumer domains like Best Buy and Amazon um, via the monetizing effort of so-called quantrepreneurs uh, and in that shift who started attending meetings to, to uh, uh, to basically take this stuff to market. And in that shift, there have been certain developments, absolutely not settled, up for grabs, very competing logics in play. Um, but you can see general developments in the kinds of algorithmic regulation that are at stake. Here we see, I'm going to run through them quickly and then end. Um, here we see Fitbit wearers who are all in this pose. I, these are all women, but um, to stave off a gender question, although now that's going to prime one. Um, I could have put men up here. <laughs> so they are consulting their dashboards and participating in the gesture of keeping track. They're using the device as a kind of digital compass for modern living, um, informing the small daily decisions, those little bits and moments that can add up to the big results. It's sort of putting you in touch with statistical truth, with the law of large numbers. You get closer to that law. Um, and what you're consulting it about is when and how much to move or eat or hydrate, etc. So this is this is still about knowing yourself, uh, but then increasingly. Um, I have at least detected a move toward the device knowing you better than you know yourself. So this is um, later than the Fitbit. This is the Samsung. Um, the device can know me better than I know myself and can help me be a better human. So it's being a better human. This is still an ethical project or couched in that language, but um, rather more epistemological authority is delegated to the device. 
Uh, and then there's a move, you know, and I'm just putting these little metonyms for this, this there's plenty of things that d do and don't fit this, but um, there, there's a move away from knowledge altogether toward guidance, uh, often in the form not of information, but, uh, and, and not numbers. There's been a dequantification. Uh, the movement has been toward um, taps, buzzes, and pokes. So it's more of a haptic, bodily um, kind of gesture. A move away from a logic of the compass in which you're consulting information to self-change toward a logic of the thermostat. And the thermostat was a metaphor um, that I heard designers using. Is that, that's what we have to be more like, is a thermostat. We have thermostats in our homes. We should have it for ourselves. Um, so this is where the person, um, you know, there's lots of different kinds of thermostats, but the, the, the guide, those which guide and nudge are trying to kind of stay in the background, perform that work of guidance in the background while you just live your life. Um, and here, I don't want to rehearse my whole talk from yesterday, but here you see the device called Mother, which almost too nicely captures this, this externalization of responsibility to technology. Um, she gives you whatever you need, whenever you need. So if, if at first it was about know thyself, now it's about an all-knowing mother. Uh, mother. Mother knows everything. Um, it says up there. And I won't explain this all, but you, you take these sensors and you um, put them on things. So um, here, I need to drink more water. It helps me concentrate better. So you put one on your water bottle. Uh, I affix a sensor. It encourages me to drink when I forget. And you can do that with pills. You put it under your pillow to wake you up. Um, and the mother website says, now you can simply live your life. So in that equation, um, ethical reflection ceases to be part of living a good life. It's, it's burdensome, it's tedious. Um, these sensors, and I'm quoting from the website again, will blend into your life and adapt to your behavior without requiring any effort, training, or care from you. Um, so in lieu of a conclusion, I thought I would um, put together a list of some of the ways that practitioners and scholars of self-tracking have been thinking about the relationship of selves um, to their data archives and devices. So here's just some. Um, I did this, this this afternoon. I was like, these were the ones that came to mind. So Kevin Kelly, um, who with Gary Wolf um, founded this, this um, I don't want to call it a, a, a um, movement. It's a community. Um, ExoSelf. Uh, we, we heard Eric Boyd earlier say digital mirror. Um, there's a, a scholars have taken up this idea of data, data double from Haggerty and Erickson. Digital doppelganger um, has been applied. Uh, data proxy, disembodied exhaust gives rise to a data proxy, an abstracted figure created from the amalgamation of data traces. Uh, prosthetic of feeling, a companion medium, a, a pixelated person, a subject divided into ever finer granularity, um, etc. So throwing these up there, and I, I will just finish with a few questions. Um, and and these, these questions are sort of sitting alongside the material of the talk. They're not yet directly engaging with it. So uh, if, in a sense, the ethical project is at heart an algorithm of sorts, some sort of if-then project, um, here maybe in this material it's one that takes a digital form uh, and perhaps then the question isn't whether algorithms are bad for the self or what they do to the self but what kind of self do specific algorithms uh, enable or constrain and how do we want to think about agency the agency of the data our own its distribution um, its mediations so I'll, I'll just end there and open up to questions thank you